morning. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to DA Gonzalez for participating in this important conversation on de decriminalizing mental health. Thank you also to the Greenberger Center for partnering with John Jay, and I should say creating this opportunity uh, to shine a light on the important issue as we uh, work as well as for the work they do broadly to reform the criminal justice system. I hope we'll have a little time to hear about Hope House, a place the Greenberger Center has been advocating for as a way of diverting people with serious mental illness. The problem of the criminalization of mental health is an issue that New York City district attorneys deal with, but it's also one that communities across the country are struggling with. We all are. I know this because last summer, we had the privilege of collaborating with the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives to convene elected officials, advocates, researchers, community leaders, and criminal justice leaders from around the country to talk about the future of public safety. And one of the themes that emerged from these conversations, one that, that we're here to talk about today was reflected in the report that we produced, is that all too frequently police are called upon to address mental health needs in the community. This can lead to tragic consequences for people who are experiencing a mental health crisis as police, district attorneys, the courts and jails and prisons are simply not designed to provide effective mental health treatment. The consensus of this impressive group of leaders who participated in the future of public safety convenings was that we need to orient our society to treat mental illness and the related issues of substance misuse, homelessness, and provide them with treatment and services rather than a criminal justice response. I know that District Attorney Gonzalez is committed to changing what, the way that the criminal justice system treats people with mental illness as well as advocating for additional resources in the community that will enable people to avoid coming into contact with his office in the first place. I'm looking forward to today's conversation and hearing more from DA Gonzalez about how we can redirect people in the criminal justice system to systems of care and treatment. Before we begin this conversation, let me tell you a bit about the impressive background of Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's DA. Eric Gonzalez is the first Latino district attorney elected in New York state. He began his legal career in the Brooklyn district attorney's office upon his graduation from law school. We share the same law school in 1995 and spent several years as a junior and then senior assistant in various bureaus within the office, including the Sex Crimes and Special Victims Bureau, Domestic Violence Bureau, Orange Zone Trial Bureau and Green Zone Trial Bureau where he was promoted to chief. During his impressive career, DA Gonzalez tried a range of cases, including homicides. After being promoted by District Attorney Thompson in March of 2014, DA Gonzalez successfully guided the launch of several key initiatives, including the creation of the office's nationally recognized conviction review unit and the office policy of declining to prosecute the possession of marijuana which he framed and implemented successfully. Since his appointment to lead the office, DA Gonzalez has implemented his own trailblazing initiatives, including bail reform, a young adult court, expansion of non-prosecution of marijuana possession, a pre-court diversion program for low-level drug, of, drug offenders, and a policy to reduce unfair immigration consequences in criminal cases. Following his swearing in as district attorney in January 2017, DA Gonzalez launched a groundbreaking initiative known as Justice 2020 to help him carry out his vision of keeping Brooklyn safe and strengthening trust in our justice system by ensuring fairness and equal justice for all. Justice 2020 consists of a 17 point action plan created by a committee of criminal justice reform experts, defense groups, service providers, law enforcement, formerly incarcerated individuals, clergy and community leaders to make the Brooklyn DA's office a national model of what a pros progressive prosecutor's office can be. This blueprint will transform the work of DA Gonzalez's office by shifting toward preventative and accountability solutions with a track record of success and away from reliance on criminal convictions and incarceration. DA Gonzalez grew up in East New York in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and attended John Dewey High School in Coney Island. He graduated from Cornell in 1992 with a dual degree 
in government and history. And in 1995, he earned his law degree at the University of Michigan Law School, where he was president of the Latino Law Students Association. He still resides in Brooklyn, less than a mile from where he grew up with his wife and three boys. So please join me in welcoming DA Gonzalez. We also have an impressive moderator who is so committed to this issue and is a passionate advocate for this issue of how we treat mental health as an illness and not as a criminal issue. In addition, to, and that is the center's executive director, Cheryl Roberts. In addition to serving as executive director of the Greenberger Center, Cheryl is the corporation counsel for the city of Hudson, New York. And previously, Cheryl was a town judge in Columbia County, New York, and served as a counsel to the committee in both the US House of Representatives and the US Senate. I now turn this over to Cheryl for what I know will be an informative and very helpful conversation. Thank you. Thank you, President Mason. I appreciate your remarks. And good morning, DA. Good to see you again. And thank you for being here. Uh, you were one of four DAs on a panel the Greenberger Center held about two years ago with the New York Daily News and the Industrial Areas Foundation about the criminalization of mental illness. We quickly learned from that panel that we needed more time with the DAs. So this time we have scheduled hour long conversations with each DA and we are so pleased to partner with the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. It's been our honor. And thank you, President Mason for partnering with us and for your introductory remarks. So DA Gonzalez, I want to start with a big picture question. Uh, today, I think most of us know that uh, of the 2.2 million people who are incarcerated nationwide, about half have mental illness and some 20% have serious mental illness. Here in New York City, as of 2020, the Center for Court Innovation found that 52% of those incarcerated at Rikers are in the so-called Brad H population, which includes people diagnosed with screened for receiving or requesting mental health services during their incarceration. So as of November 1st, 2020, some 2,430 New Yorkers were incarcerated at Rikers with mental health concerns. Sadly, we know that since then, some people have committed suicide at Rikers and we suspect the Brad H population has only increased. Your Justice 2020 plan, as President Mason mentioned, is really a blueprint for criminal justice reform, not only in Brooklyn, but as she mentioned, for prosecutors across the nation. It includes 17 reform areas, but none specifically mentions mental illness. Can you explain why and what your office is doing to decriminalize mental illness? Sure, first let me start off by saying good morning to everyone, uh, to thank the Greenberger Center for inviting me uh, to come on today. Cheryl, it's great seeing you and President Mason. Carol, it's great seeing you. Um, and so I'm happy to be here. And I think as district attorney, this conversation is so critically important to fairness and justice and, and, and ultimately to public safety. You know, when I, when I speak to, to uh, people, um, there's a, a real sense in this city that things are moving in the wrong direction in terms of public safety. And when I look at places like Brooklyn, uh, we have a lot of challenges, uh, but we have made some uh, you know, significant headway in, in battling violent crime. But there is a, a, a strong sense in our society that things are moving you know, in, the, in the bad and the opposite direction of success. I mean, and I think, uh, you know, this issue that you're raising right now with mental health and, and public safety and people who are detained on Rikers Island could not be any more timely considering the crisis that we're seeing on Rikers Island, um, understanding that, you know, there are people there um, who are being incarcerated and in large part they're there because uh, our system, our society has failed them. Um, had they been able to receive um, services, uh, you know, I think many of them, uh, and, you know, when I say many, I'm not talking about just, you know, a number, I'm talking about percentage wise, half of them may have never wound up uh, behind bars. In terms of my Justice 2020 platform, um, you know, there, there are 17 individual recommendations that stakeholders in my criminal justice system 
you know, helped me come up with. And I adopted a lot of those recommendations and said, I'm going to try to get that done by my first term as district attorney. And some of them are pretty straightforward, like the non-prosecution of marijuana, um, things that we've, we've started to do. Um, but the issue of mental health was really one that we struggled with a lot um, to see how we could um, deal with mental health issues. And I think that what's so important about Justice 2020 is the simple realization and coming from a district attorney that we over criminalize and over prosecute. And one of the core principles of Justice 2020 is that we have to reduce the number of people we're sending to jail and prison um, by reducing incarceration, by being more decarceral in the way that we approach problems, by looking towards preventative solutions and accountability solutions that don't look like prison or jail, um, we could um, benefit society. We could make it safer. We could make it fairer. We could make it just, more just, deal with uh, equity issues and racial disparities, and really also start to deal with our mental health crisis in our, in our city. Uh, because I know that as I send fewer people to jail and prison, um, there's going to be a reduction of the number of people that are there only because um, they, they've gotten in trouble based on a mental health diagnosis or a mental health issue. And so reducing those numbers um, on Rikers Island is a priority. Um, our assistant DAs are now um, receiving training and for a while now have gone through um, training and continuing legal education to be responsible for helping to identify um, people who are there on the island because of mental health. And so what I, I say to the assistant DAs, um, quite frankly, is when you get a case and when you intake a new case, what you should be looking at is who the accused is and why are they before the court? And um, not why in simple terms of what you know, crime did they allegedly commit, but what's motivating a lot of the conduct. And so I encourage them um, to reach out to family members, to reach out to defense attorneys, to reach out to others so that we can try to get a better understanding of who we're dealing with and what solutions um, could you know, appropriately handle this case, not just in terms of punishment, but really in terms of accountability, in terms of what would prevent them from coming back and how would our community be safer. Uh, I should also say, Cheryl, that you know, I, I was blessed when I became district attorney when I served as chief assistant because Brooklyn has a nationally recognized mental health court uh, pre-existing. Um, and it's, it's really a fabulous place. Um, and part of my Justice 2020 initiative is to make sure that our assistants were utilizing it. We have you know, really, a really special judge in, in, in Judge Demick. Um, and we have really dedicated social workers that work for the court and a psychiatrist who works for the court and people who really are committed to making that mental health court successful. Um, and so some of the, you know, some of the hesitancy in the past was really coming from the prosecution. You know, did that seem like, did that diversion seem like it satisfied the need for accountability and punishment and, and public safety. And so it is time that I've been district attorney and I think this is a remarkable um, stat uh, because it was already successful when I became DA, but we've more than 100% increased the number of cases that we refer uh, to our MD1 court part, which means that the ADAs are really taking this seriously, um, understanding that um, criminalizing mental health is the wrong way to approach your jobs and the wrong way to pursue public safety. Very helpful. I want a couple of follow-up questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. DA uh, Clark mentioned last uh, at our last program that her DAs uh, have trouble sometimes getting the information they need um, uh, about a person's mental conditions and um, the issues that they're facing. Um, it sounds like you in Brooklyn are able to really collaborate with the other partners in this process. Do you have a sense about whether your ADAs have a, have a hard time getting the information they need to divert more people? 
I think because we have such a strong mental health uh, court in our in our office that our attorneys, uh, both our institutional uh, partners in Legal Aid Society and Brooklyn Defender Society, but also 18B and private lawyers understand that a referral to MD1 uh, mm -hmm. is a real option and a real way to help resolve the case. Uh, people are not set to that treatment court as a setup. They're not um, set, sent there in a way that um, in some of other treatment courts, people are likely to fail. In fact, you know, the overwhelming majority of people in our mental health courts get through it. Um, and I think that's important. Uh, but there's a clear structure, right? You know, there's a legal side um, to the analysis and then a clinical side. And so on the legal side, uh, our lawyers work with social workers who are looking for um, some sort of allegation of a mental health history, but the lawyers aren't expected to confirm the diagnosis. And, and I think that in other places, in, in other DA's offices, sometimes the lawyers want to be the person who control and make the, the conclusion for themselves that this person actually is, you know, has a significant mental health uh, problem. What I say to the lawyers is, if you get that information, uh, and if you hear this, and that's either through a defender um, or a neighbor or a parent, um, and a lot of our cases come in in our elder abuse places or our domestic violence. If you hear this from a family member, that that is a sub, you know, a, a basis alone um, to make a referral. And then on the clinical side, um, we actually have the court has its own social workers which will we'll start to do the digging. And I think that's the key because the social workers now who work for our courts are going to do the digging to see whether or not there's a, you know, a history of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or, or some kind of, met, you know, major depressive disorder and all of the other types of things that we may look for, PTSD. Um, and then once they find that, once they substantiate a little bit of that, that then will go to a, psychi you know, a, a psychiatrist or for a psychiatric review who will look to then confirm that diagnosis. And then even after that, um, you know, the final piece of that is, so now we find that, that in fact, that diagnosis is actually present. Um, we'll have a forensic psychi psychiatrist and then look at it and make other kind of assessments about whether or not this person is a good candidate for the court. And so it's a real strong structure um, that's been put in place. And I think that structure um, is a big part of the success. And I also, you know, to give credit to Judge Demick, um, the fact that he's been doing this for as long as he, he's been doing it, he's earned the trust of the community, um, including um, and importantly, stakeholders outside of the criminal legal system. Because when we make these diversions and these referrals to our mental health court, as district attorney sworn to protect the public, I have an obligation of you know showing the community that this diversion will in fact, um, you know, satisfy all the requirements of the justice system, you know, safety, fairness, justice, um, and accountability. And the fact that this court has done so well over the years allows me to do that um, pretty effectively. Absolutely, I'm a fan of Judge Demix. We're gonna talk a little bit about drug court and mental health court, but I first wanna just drill down a little deeper on uh, the notion of, of how carefully you look at uh, the people that come before you in terms of their background, their mental health. Um, I wanna focus on young people. I know you care very deeply about young people and are trying very um, hard to uh, divert them from the criminal justice system altogether, whether they have mental illness or not. But when it comes to people with, with uh, young people with mental illness, we know that the onset of certain serious mental illnesses or SMI is an early childhood or sorry, early adulthood um, at a time when some people are also coming into contact with the criminal justice system. So for example, schizophrenia peaks for men between 21 and 25, women a bit older, but the signs begin much earlier. So some SMI symptoms can first appear perhaps to a school resource officer, a teacher, a police, or a DA, like a young person is being purposely evasive or provocative. 
Early symptoms can include problems with thinking and reasoning, bizarre ideas or speech, withdrawal from friends and family, lack of motivation, not meeting daily expectations such as bathing or dressing, uh, maybe violent or aggressive behavior or agitation, uh, recreational drug use or nicotine use. Uh, young people with schizophrenia can also be irritable or depressed or lack emotion or have emotions that are inappropriate for the situation or they can mistrust people. So does your youth program that you've started address young people with SMI, especially those in early onset? And how do, does it account for these realities of SMI in youth? It's such an important, uh, you know, um, observation. And, uh, you know, one of the things um, about our criminal legal system, the way it's designed, and I think uh, one of the ways that we've been really successful in our, our mental health court is that, um, you know, often the cases that are there, in fact, you know, 85% of the cases that are there are there on a, a felony. And on the felony cases, um, there are you know, significant um, collateral consequences to a conviction, whether or not jail's on the table or not. And so you know, it's usually viewed by our defenders to be in the best interest of their clients to get them into that mental health court um, because we can get them out of that court without a conviction. Um, we often will get them the services um, that they need and that's obviously the goal of the mental health court. Uh, but we can also avoid incarceration. And so for a lot of reasons on felony matters, the mental health court actually, um, you know, seems like a good um, response to the public defenders and to the defense attorneys who are handling cases. On our young people, because a lot of them are not um, getting arrested on significant felonies initially, a lot of times it looks like low level offending or you know, school um, related um, incidents. Um, we have a little bit of harder time um, encouraging um, that kind of participation in our mental health courts. Um, so we did create a young adult court um, in Brooklyn that deals with misdemeanors. Now I was a big supporter of Raise the Age. And so it's important to also um, tell everyone who's listening that my office no longer handles in criminal court um, people 16, 17 years of age. It, it's now a young adult court goes from 18 to 25. It used to go from 16 to 25. Um, and that's because uh, obviously raised the age has um, taken those cases now and sent them to family court. Uh, but also, uh, you know, quite frankly, um, these kind of cases um, or really low level school related offenses, you know, really had no place in our criminal court system in the first place. And so we, you know, in Brooklyn, our young adult court is always looking to um, provide services and connect to organizations who help. You know, we do have uh, a lot of community based partners and people who will help mentor young people and be you know, making observations for signs of schizophrenia or, or some onset of new uh, mental health disorders. Uh, it's important to say that you know, jail is really not on the table in the young adult court. Um, it, it's really a rare and exceptional case where a member, a, a person who's in our young adult court is really looking at jail cases. 97% um, of the cases, and this is a remarkable number, uh, I could not be more proud of this fact, 97% of the young adults who come into our courts leave without a conviction of a misdemeanor. Um, so we're looking at a lot of dismissals, ACDs, and violations. Um, and, and so we're trying to prevent a lot of the collateral consequences. Uh, but we don't have the same leverage in our, you know, court. So the, it's, it's uh, there's often the, the services are offered um, and uh, we rely on our partners. Um, sometimes they're like CCI, sometimes they're like community-based organizations to get services uh, to our young people. And interestingly now, um, I've funded a small pilot project in Brownsville and Brooklyn with our young population to say with these social um, 
and community-based organizations to have long-term contacts with our young people. So we refer a young person who comes in, uh, maybe they're showing signs of distress or trauma. Um, and in fact, a lot of our young people really are showing signs when they come in. Um, and we're sending them to community-based organizations to keep track of them, to work with them, um, and not just to uh, provide a service and then discharge them, but really long-term care, long-term relationships. The, the idea here is I'm gonna be my brother's keeper, my sister's keeper. I'm gonna be in contact with this young person. I'll speak for myself uh, briefly. You know, this is uh, something that I've said before. You know, I wasn't the best high school student. Um, uh, I definitely didn't think I was gonna go to college. Um, I. Uh, you know, I just assumed that I would get a job and join the military. And it was a community-based organization. It really was a person, a woman uh, named Cruz, who said, listen, Gonzalez, you're smart enough to go to college, come to my office on Saturdays. Um, and she bought me a Barron's SAT book. And so the power of these organizations to help change these young people's lives can't be underestimated. Um, and so we're, we're, we're funneling our resources into community-based options for young people to help provide those services and a lot of these mental health services. But some of our young people, in fact, do get arrested on serious significant charges. And uh, in those cases, um, they're not gonna be in our young adult court, they're gonna be in Supreme Court and one subset of that is a um, young, a lot of our young people get arrested with uh, firearms. And so I run a diversion program meant for young people, um, 18 to 22 years of age who are apprehended. And sometimes we'll go up a little higher, but not too much in age who get arrested for a gun possession, not using the gun in the commission of crime, not shooting anyone, not robbing anyone with a gun, but just the possession of the firearm. And we'll run them through a diversion program, very rigorous, um, 18 to 24 months, um, and a large part of that. And, and I think the key piece of what we've learned um, in that work is that the number of these young men are carrying guns um, because they have significant um, fear and trauma and PTSD, living in the neighborhood, seeing friends and family members killed, um, having sort of, you know, sense of, you know, um, impending doom because gang activity in their neighborhoods. Um, so I did something unique in our diversion program there. You know, typically it was run by a prosecutor. Um, I've change and I have a clinical social worker who now runs the program and we do a lot of group and individual therapy with these young men um, really dealing with their mental health issues um, a lot of these young people are not what society thinks they are people who are going to shoot and kill someone later on down the road a lot of these people have significant um, you know, early onset of mental health issues and this early intervention to save their lives. So we've done this program for a number of years now and a lot of great success stories in terms of employment and education, but really more importantly, um, in terms of moving them in the right direction in their lives um, and dealing and getting them the help and services they need to stay out of jail or prison. And so those are the, some of the programs that we're running um, but there is always a focus in, and I think it's important to say, we focus in on the individual and not just the crime that they've, they've committed. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, everyone who lives in our city wants to be safe, um, but we have to figure out what solutions get us there. And, and uh, sending those men to jail for a year or two, year, two years and not dealing with the underlying trauma is not going to be how we have long-term safety. And so that's just an example of how we wrap mental health into our thinking and how my DAs are thinking differently today than when I started in the office you know, 25 years ago. Well, first of all, congratulations on your statistic of 97%. It's really impressive. And a um, couple of things I'm wondering, um, do you have statistics on your uh, program for uh, youth who have carry a weapon, as you've just described, but don't use it? And are there any other boroughs that are taking up these programs for, for the youth? Um, in terms of, you know, success, we've had tremendous success with our, uh, for those who graduate. Now, we do have people 
um, just like our mental health courts um, who get referred and are unsuccessful and don't graduate. And often, you know, that may mean um, get rearrested and it may look like uh, incarceration or, you know, some kind of conviction. But for those young men who graduate from our program, uh, the success rates are pretty high. And I, I don't want to misspeak off the top of my head, but it was something like, you know, like 11% were rearrested on a misdemeanor, but a very small percentage were arrested on a felony and even a small percentage were arrested on a serious, significant uh, violent offense. Um, and I think that is because there was a lot of therapy, um, a lot of resources, really intensive services uh, provided, um, including early on in their uh, intake, they actually wore an ankle monitor and so, I'm not saying that this was an easy program. It's not easy to get through, um, but it saves a, a tremendous amount of money in uh, what we would otherwise be paying in jail. Unfortunately, this is not funded by anyone. So we funded out of my office's budget, uh, but high success rates. Um, and I will make sure that I get it to you, uh, Cheryl, in terms of the recidivism. Some of the other DAs have said they want to start um, this program. I know that the newly elected DA of Manhattan, uh, um, at least a Democratic nominee, Alvin Bragg, has said that he would start up a similar program. And so I think that uh, this is, you know, it always takes someone to go first. And uh, in this population, you know, because uh, the allegations are so serious about carrying a concealed weapon or having it in their home, um, that these, uh, you know, they needed someone to start this first to see, could we do this successfully? But I, I will tell you that we are um, moving in that direction um, uh, because uh, I think we really understand that a lot of these young people, the number one cause for them carrying a weapon is not because they want to commit a, a, new, a new crime, it's just because they're afraid. Right. Well, again, congratulations, and I hope this program spreads. It sounds like it's uh, worth its weight in gold. So I want to talk a little bit about drug court, um, and I suspect that at the root of why some drug courts fail and why some other courts like Judge Demick's court is successful is really the staff and the judge, but also the resources, you know, that, that are brought to bear. But um, I'd like to know more about the drug court in Brooklyn, because we know that, unfortunately, oftentimes um, people with mental illness also have a, a co-occurring substance use disorder. So it's the same population. Um, but studies have shown that drug courts can sometimes do more harm than good. Um, in fact, Fair and Just Prosecution, an organization run by a former prosecutor, has urged caution when considering using or starting a new drug court. For example, in a study of 27 drug courts, only 13 courts reduced recidivism in participants, three had no impact, and 11 actually increased recidivism in participants. And according to Fair and Just Prosecution, drug courts have been shown to increase the risk of rearrest of low level individuals or low risk individuals, though drug courts which serve felony defendants appear to be more effective at reducing recidivism and save money. Uh, meanwhile, youth drug courts can be counterproductive. A 2016 meta-analysis of juvenile drug court research concluded that juvenile drug courts have no positive impact. Um, studies have also found that people who quote unquote fail drug court programs receive sentences of up to two to five times longer than conventionally sentenced defendants facing the same charges, which I think is why a lot of defense counsel don't uh, take this option. Um, finally, drug courts can exacerbate racial disparity in the criminal justice system. Black defendants are typically less likely to be diverted to drug court in the first instance, but are then overrepresented among participants who do not graduate and thus face harsher sentences, even when they're allowed to utilize them. So what is your experience in the Brooklyn drug court? Um, have you observed these findings or does it work uh, more like Judge Demick's? Um, and what, obs what other, other observations might you have? Uh, just let me backtrack for a second, because I saw on the chat, uh, someone uh, from my office put it in, and I just wanted to put it on the record. The recidivism rate, I said, was about 11%. They said it's 9% for misdemeanor, so I apologize. It's 2% less, um, and 7% on our, someone getting uh, 
could be arrested on, on a felony case. And so I think that's really a significant factor. Um, you don't see uh, such low recidivism rates for people who go to jail uh, or prison. They're much, much higher, especially in that age population of our younger people. Um, so it's really been very successful. Uh, but when I ran for district attorney in you know, my predecessor, Ken Thompson, who I served as chief assistant for, died suddenly, actually, um, this week in uh, um, 2016. And uh, when I decided to run um, and, and start to continue the work that he had started in transforming our criminal legal system, you know, I made a lot of noise early on that I was not a big supporter of all problem um, solving courts and in particular drug courts. And a lot of that came out of my own personal experience. You know, I had a brother who was substance, uh, you know, uh, addicted to, to all kinds of substances from the time he was about 13 or 14 years of age. We, my, my family did a lot to try to get him help and treatment. Um, uh, he was unsuccessful. He did um, have a, a run-in um, and was arrested at some point. Um, and it just seemed to me that the way that our drug courts uh, dealt with uh, substance use disorder did not seem to really, in my mind, work with what I was seeing in my own family. You know, the thought that someone can be arrested and then become immediately, you know, you know have abstinence um, did not really make a lot of sense to me, was not consistent with what I had viewed in my life. Um, and the model ultimately was based on punishment. Um, and uh, so you, you're given all the stats, you've said everything that really needs to be said was that if you weren't successful in staying off drugs, um, even if they gave you a, ch a second chance or a third chance, you ultimately ended up with a conviction you often ended up with the collateral consequences in this city, a lot of immigrants and those, um, I can't tell you how many people I've seen, hundreds and hundreds of people deported on marijuana convictions or, you know, possession seven convictions for small amount of drug use. Um, and so I was not a big fan of uh, these, these courts. And I know they've done great work in, in, in some cases in saving people's lives and this testimonials regarding how people said this drug court saved my life. I just thought there was a better way of doing this work. Um, and so as part of Justice 2020, I committed you know, my staff to focus on a harm reduction model. Um, so in 2018, once I was officially um, you know, elected as the district attorney, I won in 2017, took office officially in 18, you know, we created a program um, called Brooklyn Clear, which is we work with service providers um, to reach out to people who have been arrested at the point of their arrest. And they'll get five to seven days um, to work with a peer counselor, often someone who shared a, you know, a history of substance use disorder to get into services. Um, and you know, I think harm reduction is a better model um, if they get into a um, any kind of service that they need. And sometimes, like you said, it's not just drug treatment. Sometimes there's all kind of other services they need. We're going to look at um, not prosecuting the case at all um, and just relying on community-based partners to do this work. But, um, you know, you know, in my career, and I've handled a lot of drug cases, Cheryl, in my career. At one point, I had a rotation throughout um, Narcotics Bureau. You know, I, we were sending people to prison um, simply because, um, you know, they couldn't beat their habits. And so I do think there's a place for drug courts. Um, there are people who are causing harm by their drug use. Um, because they're also selling drugs to sustain their habits. And so they're not only just using, they're, sustaining, they're selling uh, drugs and obviously the opioid crisis that we're dealing with. I th do think there's a limited role for drug courts to get people um, off you know, um, drugs and, and into treatment, but really um, the model that we're gonna pursue here in Brooklyn is harm reduction. And so, um, you know, I don't know that necessarily everyone agrees with me. Um, and I know that the courts 
continue um, to put resources towards opioid courts and other kind of uh, you know heavy um, court interventions. But I do believe that in, in this area of, uh, of uh, the law where we need more resources, we need more community-based organizations, we need more therapy and services on the ground. And so that's what, what I'm doing as DA, although we do have a drug court in Brooklyn um, and there are cases that go there. I think an, a more appropriate use of our drug courts and where I started to move those cases is where someone is creating some kind of community harm, they're stealing, they're um, you know, breaking into cars, they're doing things that are hurting the residents of Brooklyn, and what's driving that is a substance use disorder, and to sort of have the court supervision and some of the resources the courts have in their lives, I think, makes a lot of sense, but on the pure, you know, um, use of substance use, uh, um, someone who is using drugs, um, and they're using it to help self-medicate mental health issues and others, um, we think there's a better way of handling them than by threatening them that if they don't get off the drugs, we're gonna send them to jail. Um, thank you for that response. Yeah, it's not, uh, not a straightforward um, path. I, I apologize for looking down, but we're getting so many questions from the audience that I, I think I'm going to switch over to audience questions now. We only have about 15 minutes and I wanna make sure we get to some of these. Um, so I apologize again for looking down, but let's see. Uh, one says, um, given the stigma associated with mental illness and the fact that some mental illnesses are associated with a lack of insight, how do you address cases where an individual may have a serious mental illness but does not want mental health court, either because they don't want to be labeled that way or because they don't recognize they have an illness? It's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge, and, th and there um, is where having a good advocate and a, um, and a good social worker involved, and obviously uh, a good lawyer. And you know, the lawyers um, really. Do, and and I think that I'm also patient, and I think that matters um, in a lot of you know law enforcement offices and district attorneys' offices across the country. It's either you take an immediate. Um, responsibility of it on the case and you say okay and we'll be willing to give diversion but if it's not immediate then diversion is pulled off the table so we'll offer a diversion if you're not willing to to you know sort of if you're not in the right place to to accept that offer or to deal with it in a lot of district attorneys offices across the country that offer is then rescinded and then you're looking at jail or, or some you know traditional thing in our office we understand that it takes times for the social workers and for the lawyers to build a rapport necessary with their clients in order to get them to the right place to even start to consider this mental health diversion or, or court diversion and so I, I do not take the position that a lot of colleague DAs, and I'm not saying in New York City, but just across the United States, take, it's like, if you don't take this now, the next offer is five years. And so that's a big piece of getting people successfully into our, our programs. I, I can't, uh, first, I applaud you for taking that stance. It's not an easy stance as a DA. I've seen it upstate when I was a judge. It was definitely take this or leave it. And as you suggest, that's not, you know, the way to go with someone, like you say, who may not be ready to meet, meet, you know, where, where you are, um, but the long-term implications of them then continuing to cycle through the system makes no sense for anyone. So I really applaud you. Um, sure, I would just add to that, listen, we, we live in a time where there's a real deficit in trust in government and a deficit in trust in our criminal legal and our criminal justice systems. And so you have to give people the time to get to where they need to be in order to avail themselves to what we all want. We all want to help them. Absolutely. And this is a related question. You've kind of answered it, but it says uh, some people are asked to plead to more serious offenses to qualify for these specialty courts. Why? If they don't succeed, they do time for offenses that they didn't commit. So does your office have that policy? No, I mean, you know, I, I think that that's not what's intended. I, I, Often, you know, there's a, a there is a jail alternative in a lot of these cases, um, but they're meant 
Um, and I think this is a, a, an also an important piece that came out of our thinking about uh, over incarceration is we don't always need to have the top count, right? If, if the case is worth, <clears throat> the case was worth two years jail on a typical case, I don't ask the lawyers to take pleas to, to get a, a top count of five years, right? Like they can come down and say, the case is worth two years jail. A normal person who would, you know, get this would be looking at two years jail. This is a person who we're trying to divert. If they're unsuccessful, they shouldn't get five years when everyone else gets two years. So they should plead to a jail alternative that's consistent with our thinking of justice. And that's something else that I am significantly, you know, making sure that we talk to our lawyers about. Yeah, uh, again, I applaud you. Um, another question, I'm curious about the challenges that come uh, with the model, the young adult court model. Um, in particular, where did you find the funds and is this sustainable without external funding? So I don't know if President Mason was partially responsible for this, but we did uh, write a grant um, to the Department of Justice when she was in charge of, I guess, Office of Justice programs, and it was trailblazing. There was no, no there was, believe it or not, there was no young adult court in our state and very few in the country. Um, so it was a, a model um, court of taking young people and looking at brain science and, and talking about social services. So we did get a grant to start us up, which allowed us to get a social worker. I didn't really talk a lot about the, the format of the Young Adult Court, but it's also service intense and there's social workers that are part of the process. Um, and so we have gotten some funding. I will also thank the uh, New York City Council for both our Brooklyn Clear um, harm reduction model for, uh, for, you know, for drug arrest and for young adult court, we do get funding. And we do get a, a number of uh, dollars um, from our uh, city council members who are really committed to um, stopping the over-criminalization of young people. Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, one says, in many places, and this is from uh, my friend in New Orleans, Janet Hayes, I'm pretty sure, uh, many places like New York City and New Orleans have police crisis intervention and many people are diverted by the police or district attorneys. However, once diverted, people hit the, quote, acute care wall and are not able, <clears throat> excuse me, to access long-term outpatient and clinical residential supports. Is this consistent with the DA's experience? Do you have a problem placing people in long-term residential supportive housing? like Hope House, for example. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, it's actually terrible. And so, you know, first of all, I want to, you know, recognize the Greenberger Center um, for doing something. And, and I know you've been working on it for years to get this up and it just shows how hard it is to do this, to get a semi-secured facility or a secured facility. Um, the city just has not been willing um, to really uh, do that and the state hasn't been willing to do it. There's a lack of beds, of hospital beds um, in the statewide area because they kept closing facilities. And so we're often, even in our great MD1 part, we're often waiting, um, we have someone in jail and we have to make a terrible choice if, you know, to release them without the supportive services they need into a shelter system or to wait and hold on to them in Rikers Island until we can get a facility made available to them. And that, and that really should never be the case. If someone is ready um, to be diverted, the fact that they have to be kept in Rikers Island for a couple of weeks or a week, even to find a bed for them is really an outrage. And then um, as you know, many of your listeners probably realize, um, you know, I'm not an expert on you know, Medicaid or anything, but the inability um, often to get people qualified for money and to pay for these services um, because they're a, uh, you know, considered incarcerated um, is really an outrage um, because really these monies, if there was dollars as associated of care associated with these people, we could actually get them into services and programming a, a lot faster and easier and really get better outcomes. Um, uh, we get better outcomes because a lot of, of our, in my history, at least I should say, I see a lot of people who've gone in um, have gotten better. Um, you know, they've received care. Um, but then they start to decompensate because uh, they're not being uh, 
removed at the appropriate time. So the, the, their issue there is um, there's not a lot of uh, resources um, there and there's not a lot of places. Um, so I really uh, salute you, Cheryl and, and Francis and everyone who helped get this Hope Center um, off the ground. And I'm looking forward to visiting it when it's fully open. Thank you, Dia, I appreciate it. And we're hoping to break ground in the spring. Um, and I just wanna say that the New York City Council has been absolutely fabulous in supporting Hope House, the planning of it for the last six years, they've stuck by us. Um, it's unfortunately been the state that has um, at times lagged behind. And I think it's really based on federal policy that they're stuck with. So you're right, it's federal Medicaid policy. It's not that we don't know how to treat this population. You know how to do it. We know how to do it for rich people at places like Austin Riggs and Silver Hill, but we don't choose to do it for a, the, uh, a less wealthy population. So it is about money. We have to somehow get the money funneling down to the community to have these residential facilities. So I appreciate your, your shout out. Um, I want to um, just ask, let's see, we have maybe one more question or two. Um, and this one says, although out half of those at Rikers have Brad H designation, 85% of women at Rikers do. It's a very important point. Women are also less likely to recidivate and detention takes children um, away from their mothers. Have you given any thought on ways in which women can be better supported and diverted? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it should be, uh, I should say that um, for a while, we've been now working with organizations to figure out housing and other alternatives to um, housing people on Rikers Island, um, especially women, uh, because the number of people, young, particularly young women getting arrested has really grown um, in the last several years. Um, so we work with WPA and other organizations to do important work. We have other um, people that we work with locally in Brooklyn as well. Uh, during COVID, um, you know, and I, I had to take a really hard look as district attorney, and I really felt like I was making decisions that could impact people's, you know, health and maybe, maybe their lives. You know, we agreed to release over 300 people from Rikers Island from the Brooklyn population. A number of them were women. Um, it was actually a woman who was released on a really significant um, charge that um, had her involved in, in a um, uh, an allegation that she participated in a homicide. So at really, at a really high level, and we really worked very closely with our defender organizations and community partners to find supportive housing and other places to get as many people off um, the island as possible. We're doing that again now during this humanitarian crisis, looking very carefully about who the person is. And again, you know, my thinking is it's really about the person. It's not just about the charge that they're in, you know, detained on. It's really about who they are. And so we're really trying to sit down and look at medically vulnerable people and people who we think can be successful and safe on the outside. And I think, you know, for me, um, that is the big factor. I, as district attorney, have to feel, and I, I weigh in on these cases, I have to feel that I can keep the community safe um, while releasing this person. And so there is a, um, a lot of back and forth with the um, social workers and, and uh, with the public defenders in a lot of these cases about figuring out resources and supervised release and other kind of factors about how we can get um, people who we don't think are a danger off the island until so a large portion of those look like uh, women. And, and uh, as all of you know, and I'm not an expert on this, but as all of you know, the women who tend to be in prison um, tend to come in from long histories of trauma and abuse. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's, there's really things we can do um, to be supportive of that population um, and, and move them towards a better place in their life and towards a safer place for all the people who they deal with, including uh, their children. So we have three minutes. So just maybe a quick response. I want to just sneak in one more question um, because someone's asking what happens to inmate services once they leave the correctional system and back into your community. And I know you have the Kings County Reentry Task Force that you started. Could you just mention that quickly and tell us about that? Yeah, so we, we do. We receive um, grant money 
and funding. Uh, we have a tremendous reentry program and the task force is, we have the task force and we have our own reentry uh, program. So between the two of them, um, people who are leaving uh, often state prison or people who are on parole and, and are returning citizens to our community. And we all know that 95% of folks come back home. Um, this is a way that we work with, um, you know, um, social workers and, and, and therapists and, and all kinds of people to provide services. And so if there's a person who's coming out with a mental health diagnosis, they'll be given a parole officer who has some specialized training. We will work with that person. We will, and so my office actually hires, um, you know, works with uh, counselors who will then sort of be their case manager. Um, and so we, as as the social workers in my office will take on clients and help them make sure that they're successful, you know, following up with them, taking them to appointments, making sure that they follow on, you know, any kind of uh, ordered medicine regimens and just sort of being omnipresent in their life and then just sort of helping them on other reentry services. So helping them establish, you know, driver's licenses and IDs and, and looking for work. And so this is a, a connection coming out of, this is the way it should work, right? This is coming out of state prison, being met on the ground by the community to help restore you, um, bring you back and hopefully um, prevent recidivism. And so I'm very proud of the, the members of the task force. The task force is huge. Um, in terms of service providers and clergy and stakeholders and community-based organizations. They meet all the time. They meet in my office uh, often, um, and they're really committed um, to returning home brothers and sisters of Brooklyn uh, successfully. And so it's something that should be modeled across the country. Yeah, terrific, bravo, and to the providers and everyone on your task force, thank you. Thank you, DA, uh, so much for um, doing the work that you do for spending the time with us this morning. Thank you to John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Carol Mason and Erica Bond um, for, for uh, partnering with us. And thanks to the Greenberger Center and, and my staff for putting this all together. Um, it's 10 o'clock, I know you have other things to do. So thank you and thanks to the people who are tuning in and for your great questions. We'll see you for DA McMahon uh, next week. Take care. Thank you, everyone, bye. Bye-bye.